Please stand with me as we uh, turn to our passage today from Psalm 119. Uh, as has been our practice um, over the past of the summer, or some of the Psalms, we're working through Psalm 119. I have the privilege of taking you through the next two sections, the letters Gemel and Daleth. So Psalm 119, verses 17 through 32. Uh, so please stand as you're able for the reading of God's word. Uh, and after which I will uh, ask you to respond. I'll say this is the word of the Lord. I ask you to respond with thanks be to God. Okay, we're ready? If you're able, read with me, please. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me, and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> so at the highest level, it's unsurprising that today's passage is about the word of God. That is the theme at the highest level of all of Psalm 119, right? So we see clearly laid out here the name of God, uh, the Word of God. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I think it's interesting, and I, I, as I was reading it, I got a little obsessed with the different um, usages, different words, similes, metaphors, really similes, I guess, uh, describing um, the Word of God, the different words used for the Word of God, different uh, words for it. Uh, as such, I actually, I, I forgot to actually ask you reading, I was going to say, hey, as you read through it, notice how many different words are used. We have word, okay, law, commandments, all throughout this passage. It got to the point that as I was studying this week, I started highlighting each different um, other reference to the word of God, different ways it's referred to. And so I'm saying, well, okay, is this something that is in the text itself, or is this something like the, the translator trying to make it, you know, mix it up and not be the same word, word, word over and over again, right? Um, interestingly enough, it actually is in the original Hebrew. Uh, different words are used to try by the psalmist to talk about the Word of God. So before we dive into the context of the passage, I want to add one more note, because you know, as we're coming up here throughout the whole summer we're doing this passage, I thought I'd add one more little bit to the background that we have of saying, okay, well, we'll see these words used over and over. What do they mean? Let's get a quick look at them and see... And they're, I, by the way, I'll say they're pretty good English translations of what the Hebrew says. I'm not going to try to read the Hebrew. I'm not even going to attempt that. I have it written down. That was as far as I went with that. But um, although I will say one of them, because the first word, law, that we see is Torah, which many are familiar with Torah, right? It literally means instruction. Instruction. So what to do, what the instructions are. It's like you're putting something together, need instructions from Ikea or whatever. It's instructions. How do you do this? What, what, is, the, what is the law for assembly in this case, right? Um, the second word you see often here is testimony or testimonies, right? And this is what God solemnly testified to be his will. So there's a, there's a coloring, an aspect of that word that says, what is God's will, right? It's his word, but it colors like, what is he saying he wants from us, for us, etc. right? What is God's will, right? The next word we see is precepts, right? And that is what God has appointed to be done. Right? What is God saying is going to happen? What are his precepts? Okay. Finally, okay. Uh, next, statutes. There's a couple of words in Hebrew for this. They both are, are similar and related, so we use the word statutes for both. And this is interesting because it has an aspect of the divine lawgiver. What has the divine lawgiver laid down as his law? Again, another way of thinking of the word of God, God's law. The statutes. Next, commandments. Right. Well, this is actually a pretty straightforward translation. What God has commanded. Okay. God says, this is my commandment. 
You know, do you love one another, for example? Well, okay, commandment of God, right? Um, next, rules. The, the, the psalm uses the word rules a few times, right? What the divine judge has ruled to be right. Okay, you have still an aspect of law there. What is right, what is moral, what is ethical. What the divine judge has said, this is my nature, this is what is right. Uh, and the final one here is, well, word, which we see a lot. God's word. And simply, this is the broad, probably the broadest category. It's what God has spoken. That covers it all. What God has spoken is his, his word. Right? And that is what we have recorded in Scripture. So with that little side background, I want to think. So as we go to the passage today and talk about some of these, a few times I'm going to pull out, okay, he used this particular word, so notice the, the context of that. Um, but uh, in general, just as we're reading the passage, and actually through the rest of Psalm 119, notice the changes. There's a reason that the psalmist all throughout is going to use these different words all for God's law, for God's word. Right? Okay. So. I would say today's passage, unsurprisingly, is well split in two because we have two different letters we're addressing, as we we're going to do each week, right? But I would say these two passages provide us with two contrasting but connected, and I'll say of necessity, complementary views of the psalmist. The psalmist in both these passages is talking a little bit about their own situation in both cases. Right? They're, they're crying out to the Lord about something going on. And so because we believe it's the same psalmist, they clearly must be complementary, right? They, they have to both be true of the psalmist, which, for simplicity's sake, I may say David sometimes. I know we talked previously, I think Mike had mentioned, and John mentioned as well, I think, that we don't know that David wrote this, but it's pretty likely. There's actually a lot of in-textual in, in evidence for that. But And so you'll read commentaries, I'll talk about it, and some will just, just assume David. They'll say David all throughout. Others will say the psalmist and be very you know, rigorous because they don't know for sure that David wrote it. But there's a lot of evidence. It's probably David. Um, so if I say David, forgive me, it's the psalmist, probably David. Um, okay, and, and that happens, right? Uh, so uh, so I think, as, as mentioned, these two views are connected. The first we'll see, and uh, we'll, we'll dive into Gamel here, is that we have um, a pilgrim who is dependent upon God's grace, and he's in the land, a foreign land, clearly a pilgrim would be in the land that's not their own, right? And he's, being, and he's under turmoil and being falsely accused of things in this foreign land in which he's traveling, right? So he's away from home, uh, and he's being accused in a foreign land and under turmoil, right? That's the first picture of this psalmist, right? And wrongly accused, we'll see. He says, I'm wrongly accused. That's what he's implying here, right? Okay. In our second passage, Daleth, we'll see, um, we, is going to view a whole, kind of the opposite view, right? This is a man who is in love with the stuff of this world, the very world he's a foreigner in. He's in love with the stuff of this world, Right? And he knows that he's dependent upon it, or that he loves it. But in the end, he is being dependent upon God and God's grace to take him through. Despite his love of the stuff, he's being dependent upon God's grace, right? So, it seems like maybe they're opposites, but at the same time, they're connected, right? Because I think we all know that tension of, of the love of the world around us, the stuff in it, but also the recognition that we are saved by grace and that we are strange in a strange land, right? So let's dig into each of these. And kind of see the aspects we see. Uh, and so, um, here. oh, by the way, I picked, uh, I joked, I was going to say, I didn't do a, I'm not going to do a three point sermon, you know, traditional three point sermon. I'm doing a six point sermon. Um, so, there you go. <laughs> it it kind of fell out. But what's funny about that is, like Mike had mentioned earlier, but the, the, he actually got his copy of a book. Um, who was I have it written down here? The, done by Charles Bridges. And Charles Bridges wrote a book on Psalm 119 where he wrote, I think it's got to be two to five pages per verse. Not per chapter, per verse. So like each line, the boundaries with your servant that I may live and keep your word. That he has illuminated two to five pages on. That, right? It's a, it's a dense book. It's good stuff. I went through, got through a lot of it this week. Not all of it, sorry, Mike. I got through a lot of it, but it's a lot. Um, so clearly there's a lot in these passages, a lot of meat you could dig into. I could have picked 10 points probably or 50 points, but, you know, we do need to get home at some point. So I picked six points, I think, are pretty clear. Some are a little dense, so you can see where I was like, well, I can't really do that many points. I'm going to kind of combine these together. So maybe it was entirely organic. It, it might have been a little forced. So, okay, let's start with passage one, though. Um, and we'll look at these uh, different points that I think are um, – uh, evident in the sermon, and, and actually kind of fall in order here. So, um, so starting at the beginning, oh, let's put more page here. So our first passage, as I said, which is starting in verses 17 and going through verse 24. 
Um, we see the psalm describing himself as a pilgrim dependent upon God's grace and a, in the midst of false accusations and turmoil in this foreign land. So pilgrim, right? Okay, so in that, there's an implicit dependency on God. Where do we see that? We'll start with the first verses here, right? The battle with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things about your law, right? Okay, how is there dependency in this? Well, this is supplication. Right? But with the concept of publication, this is a request. He's asking God for something he recognizes he can't do himself. Right? Um, he can't live and keep God's word on his own. That's why he's asking God, deal bountifully with me that I may keep your word. Right? He can't see the wondrous things of God's law on his own. Hence, the request, the supplication, open my eyes that I may see. If he could do it on his own, he would not be dependent upon God. But clearly, he must be dependent upon God. It, it's of necessity, right? Okay, so these supplications, requests, as we said, the first was for bounty and keeping God's word. Okay, so what is a bounty in this case? I'm not thinking like a bounty hunter or anything like that or, you know, those things, but more like, I mean, it's a similar concept. The root is the same, right? But we're thinking of a gift that overflows, a bounteous amount of something, right? A bounty of goodness, right? He, he, he's saying, Lord, Give me an abundance of this thing I'm asking for, a bounty of it, right? And what he's asking for an abundance of is to live in, in the Word, right? To keep the Word, right? It's almost like he's asking to live longer to be able to serve God longer, to live every day in God's Word, right? What a, what a beautiful picture of the bounty of God to keep his Word, right? That's what he's asking for, right? The keeping of God's words is the bounty he's asking for. That is the blessing. The, the blessing of keeping God's word. Because again, can we do it on our own? Could he do it on his own? No, we can't keep God's word on our own. We, we are incapable apart from the Holy Spirit. And, and his dependency on the Holy Spirit is clear and evident throughout the whole passage here. Um, so, <laughs> one commentary I read, I love this way of saying it here. There is no life worth living that is not a life of obedience and delight in God's word. That's a beautiful way of putting it. No life worth living that is not a life of obedience and delight in God's word. Again, it is his word here that is the, bount the, the bounteous thing he's asking for, right? Um, and he, of course, answers. God answers and provides that for us. Hence the request. This is why the psalm is going to him, right? Now, the second thing we see him asking for is to see God's wonders, right? So what wonders, right? We could, I mean, there's clearly scriptures full of the wonders of God. I think in this case, you may look to the Exodus, where God actually talks about this. So he's talking to the Moses, uh, Exodus 3.20, He's saying, hey, I'm going to take, you're going to take your people out of Israel. In fact, I'm going to do it. You're going to use you, but I'm doing it, right? And then this is where he says, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. So God's going to display his wonders, clearly just recorded in Scripture what his wonders were, the plagues on Egypt, um, the, the Passover, the, the crossing of the Red Sea. These things are the, the, the wonders of God displayed in the Old Testament that the psalmist likely is seeing again. The wonders of God. Let me see these and experience them again, right? Later, we see at the crossing of the Jordan. So, for the next, if you know the history of Israel, escape from Egypt was one generation, right? And 40 years go by, a new generation, for reasons we'll get into right now, but we all know the story, right? Um, this new generation has their own wonders of God they see, which is called the crossing of the Jordan, right? Followed soon by the, the fall of, um, of Jericho, right? The wall has been destroyed by the Lord, right? So, Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. This is what he said right before they crossed the Jordan, right? Right before he says, hey, take the ark, start walking, you'll see what God's going to do. It's going to be pretty cool, right? Um, so, again, we see these concepts of God's wonders that he's asking to see. But how interesting, because you'd think, well, I can just read about that and see God's wonder, right? But to truly really marvel at it requires God to show us his wonders, right? Yes, we could read it dryly in Scripture, but it doesn't affect us, it doesn't change us apart from the Holy Spirit working in us. So, again, we have the psalmist, which we like to picture, as Mike said, I think the first uh, Sunday in 119, as possibly David himself reading through and memorizing and, re and writing down his hand copy he was supposed to do of the Old Testament law, and as he goes through there, being struck by the works of God, the wonders of them, right? Um, we also see wonders in his nature and ways. From Romans 11, 33-34, we said, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? How unsearchable and inscrutable is the Lord. 
Uh, what an amazing picture Paul had of, of God's just glory, um, his wondrous things that he does. And of course, the culmination of wondrous things is Christ. Right? Not to give too much of the plot away here, but the culmination of those wonderful, wondrous things is that there's a plan for salvation, that we are saved by grace. So, okay. So for this first couple of verses here, I'd say it is one thing to have some head knowledge of what God has done and who he is. Right? We, we can recognize that. We, people, there are many dry academics who know Scripture, but they know the Lord. Right? Um, it is another thing for God to reveal himself to you. He does this by his power, through his word, and upon our request of him to do so. Right? He is waiting for us to ask him, Lord, show me what your word says when we go to it. Um, and that is, and he will. Right? Um, <laughs> and it's funny because this relationship with God associated with his word is, 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 it shows up actually in, in sociology, which I think is very interesting. Um, there is a, uh, a recent book, just came out like last week, I think. Nancy Piercy, who is a, a, a student of, of Francis Schaeffer, she's written a number of really good books. She had a book called The Toxic War on Masculinity. Right? It's kind of a twisting that around, not toxic masculinity, but The Toxic War on Masculinity. It's a really good book. Um, and she makes a point. She said the sociological studies found something very interesting in this analysis of recently, because used to, the, the story was, all right, and you heard this all the time. It's ironically, and I think in the interview I heard with her, she points out that mostly pastors would say this, which is the funny thing about it, because it's not a true statistic. Well, at least it seemed to be true, but the idea that, oh, divorce is just as bad in the church as it is in the world. Just as many Christians are divorced as, get divorced as in the world, right? Uh, as an example, because the study of marriage, right? <laughs> it's like, the strange thing of that is mostly pastors say that, right? Now, that did come from sociological studies at one point, but there was a key problem with those studies that has been corrected of late that has shown some amazing things, right? Because the, the old adage was, oh, abuse is actually worse in the church than outside the church. The people in the church divorce just as much as people outside the church, right? And really, what is, you know, none of, what, it's all fake. None of it matters, right? Well, they, they did an interesting thing. They never differentiated before between what we call nominal Christians and what we call evangelical Christians, or church-going evangelical Christians. So nominal evangelical Christians, Protestants, and church-going ones. And recent studies are doing this distinction, saying not just asking, check a box if you're a Baptist, or if you're a this, or you're a that, right? But saying, do you go to church? Like, how often do you go to church? Do you go to church, you know, how often do you your family in church, right? And making the categorization. And the funny thing, something came out of that, which I think is fascinating. First, um, that we had the regular church attenders, what we'll call true evangelicals, true Christians, um, in these studies of marriage, they found something that they were surprised by as sociologists, because they weren't Christians, clearly. They found that wives in these groups reported the highest level of marital satisfaction of any group studied. All groups studied, and they split it now into very dis discrete verses. Ver they have a lot more de degradations of this than they used to have, right? Um, wives in this group of true evangelicals had the highest rates of satisfaction, marital satisfaction, right? They had the lowest rate of divorce of any group studied, right? Um, Evangelical men are 35% less likely to be divorced than secular men. Okay? They had the lowest rate of violence, um, uh, marital violence, amongst any group studied. 2.8% was the number, amount of violence you know, per group uh, capita studied, right? Okay? That's for, now they desegregated. But so what was it, the deal? Why was it the same before they started studying it this way and separating it out? So nominal evangelicals, strangely enough, Right, wives in nominal evangelical uh, relationships, marriages, report significant levels of unhappiness worse than secular men. They uh, found when spending time with children that, that nominal Christians who say I'm a Christian but never go to church, like they have this check the box, oh I grew up with this and that's it, they spend less time with their children either in shared activities or in discipline than any other group including secular men. They are 20% more likely to divorce than secular men. And they have the highest rate, this is the most shocking, the highest rate of violence amongst all groups studied. 7.2% of marriages of, of men who called who were basically nominal Christian, who said, oh, I'm a Christian on paper, but never goes to church, right? 7.2% of those marriages have violence within them. It's incredible, right? So sociologist Brad Wilcox, who's not a Christian, who did this initial study on this. He said, the most violent husbands in America are nominal evangelical Protestants who attend church infrequently or not at all. Right? 
Um, so why is this huge contrast? Why is this group worse than secular men when it comes to this, um, the, the study of marriage, right? They have enough familiar, the, the theory is they have enough familiarity with Scripture and this concept of Christian living to have picked up on concepts of headship and submission, right? But they have no real knowledge of what God says about those things and what the Scripture says about those things. They don't know anything actually about it, right? They just have picked up these concepts, right? And, they, and they're now even doing worse. I'd call them third commandment violators. They're actually saying, you do this because God says so, even though they know nothing about God. They don't know God. They have no relationship because they don't spend any time with his people, right? This is how important it is not to just have head knowledge of Scripture, but to spend time in Scripture, in community, studying Scripture, right? Knowing it in the power of the Holy Spirit working through us in that circumstance because what a difference that makes. Isn't that incredible? It's amazing statistic. And, and, and so it took all the numbers that for so many years they've had, well, Christians are just as bad, and said, oh, okay, well, maybe actual Christians will say people actually... It means something to them, but should go to church, okay, maybe it does work. Maybe there is something there. Um, and how strange that the nominal Christian is so much worse than even a secular man in all these cases. And these marriages are so much worse off. Anyway, I thought that was fascinating. And I said, as, as, a, as a picture of this lacking of time in Scripture, what an interesting outcome of that, of, of not knowing truly the Lord, but maybe having some head knowledge of his Scripture. What a, what a result. So, um, Anyway, all of that is just, is just incredible. So we cannot know, know Scripture apart from the power of the Holy Spirit and God, right? We must know it from his power, working through us in community as Christians, right? That is where knowledge of Scripture comes from. So, so in light of this, I asked myself this question this week. I said, well, okay, when was the last time when I was, uh, apart from when I started writing the sermon, that I seriously spent time in prayer asking God not just to help me obey him, but help me to obey his word? I think there's a distinction there, because um, his word is him, right? That is what he's laid out for us. So, uh, like the psalmist, we can ask God without hesitation, and, and we can expectantly hope and know that he will guide us in that, help us to obey him better in his word, uh, by spending time in it, and by praying to ask him to show it to us, his wonders and his word in a bounteous fashion. So, moving forward to our second point today. That was point one, right? Point two. The child of God is a pilgrim in this hostile, accusatory, and changing world, but can find peace and justice in God and his word. Right? Kind of a long point. It's a lot there, I know. Uh, that one's kind of long because I actually combined a few separate points. I realize I don't, I don't want to talk forever. And you know, here I am. We're talking forever about it. So that happens. Um, first, start with the picture of the child of God as a pilgrim. So verses 9 through 20, you see, we talk about, I am a sojourner on the earth, says the psalmist. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules. At all times, right? Um, this is a this is a picture, by the way, uh, that we see a lot in Scripture. The idea of the sojourner on the earth um, that 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 we as believers are sojourners, right? Of course, the prototypical example, the original example, would be uh, uh, you know Abraham, Abram at the time, called away to be a sojourner in a foreign land, a promised land for him, right? Um, what we see in First Chronicles as well, uh, starting in verse twenty nine. For we are sorry, chapter nine, verse fifteen. For we are strangers before you and sojourners. Us, all our fathers were, uh, sorry, as our fathers, all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. Um, this actually points, by the way, to Psalm 20, uh, 39, verse 12. It says, Hear my prayers, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my uh, tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like my fathers. And of course, in Hebrews 11, the great hall of fame here, we see these are these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having knowledge that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. We have this picture of us as believers, as sojourners on a fallen, a fallen world, right? We, we, we know to be true. So what does a sojourner do, right? Um, they travel in a land that's not their home. That's kind of the definition of sojourner, right? Okay. Um, so what is consistent in such a journey? If you're traveling through a land that's not your own, Abram, traveling to the promised land, what, what is consistent? Are the people consistent? Probably not, no, right? Is the landscape consistent if you're traveling? No. If you travel to the west, you see some beautiful landscape, but it's different as you go, right? Um, how about the local laws and customs? Are they always the same as you're traveling through this far land? 
not necessarily. So many of you know I went to uh, France a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> I hadn't told the story to everyone yet, but um, what you might not know is I got a ticket while I was there, a speeding ticket. It showed up in my mail, actually, after the fact, right? Here's what's funny about that is um, it's on French, right? You know, it's not my, it was definitely a foreign land. I was, travel, I was traveling in a rented Renault, you know, driving down the road, just having left the airport, the first day there, um, trying to figure out, you know, what kilometers means in this situation, right? What is that circle line? What is, is that, is that a speed limit sign? It must be a speed limit sign. It's a number with a circle around it. Okay, we'll say it's a speed limit sign. Never driven in a foreign country before. Been in many vehicles in foreign countries, but never driven before. New experience for me. Um, and I passed this big sign, all in French, saying something about how this whole thing is for your, for the benefit of the public and for your protection. This whole giant block of text. I'm like, what is it talking about? I'm trying to translate it in my head as best as I can. I don't know a lot of French, but a little. And so like, what was that about? I say, see a big flash. <laughs> What was that about? All right. All right. Sure enough, three weeks later, here's a ticket. You are going too fast in that section of the road. It's automatically monitored. All right. That's what that means, by the way. The long block of French text, uh, which I worked out later. It's like, oh, okay. Well, I'll probably see that later. Uh, I guess we'll. And sure enough, it showed up. Um, so it's it, it, the, the customs change from place to place, right? And and that's one that I wish uh, had been a little different. Uh, <laughs> it was only 45 euros. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it is kind of funny that. Uh, <laughs> Of all the things, uh, my first my first day in a foreign country uh, on this trip, and I get a ticket driving. So uh, there you go. So uh, local customs certainly don't don't say the same as you go through foreign lands, right? Um, but what is consistent on such a journey? What can we depend upon and rest in in this foreign journey, in this foreign land, in this world that we live in that is not our home? The psalmist is saying in this passage that it is God's word that is constant. That God himself, as expressed through his word, is constant. And we can depend upon it wherever we are in this world. Whatever our circumstance is, we can depend upon it. Right? We can rest in it for our rest when we're weary in this travel, travel in this world. Right? Um, th- this is why he asks to know it and is consumed with longing for it. Um, it's funny, my wife and I talked about what type of things consume our longing. Like, what is it that I, cons- I, that I long for? Uh, and... and most days, it's, it's probably my cell phone or, you know, something sitting around. That, oh, what's going on in the world today kind of stuff, right? You know, there was a, there was a coup in Russia yesterday. I'm like, oh, what's going on with that thing? I know the news, right? Or this past week with this crazy submersible thing and this thing constantly checking. Oh, did they find the people? Oh, they all died. Oh, okay, that's sad. Then all the morbid questions are popping up in Google. It's like, what happens to a body when it has been compressed under the ocean? Oh, I kind of want to know that, right? It's like, it's what seems to obsess us. It says a lot about who we are sometimes, and I can't help it. Sometimes I am obsessed by the stuff of this world, like my cell phone, right, for example, right? But here we see that the, the psalmist saying his soul is consumed with longing for God's rules at all times, right? What a beautiful, what a beautiful thing to have your soul consumed with longing for, right? Um, that can be our souls as well in the power of Christ, right? He gives us that longing for his word if we ask for it and we spend time in his word, right? Okay, so um, so this is a journey, as we said, we kind of hit a bunch of time, is our lives as Christians. This journey in a foreign land is our lives, right? We are strangers in a strange land, uh, as, as Abraham was. Uh, the one thing we can depend upon to be unchanging is God and his word. So um, do we long for it? That's the question, right? And the application there is, how do we long for it? We pray to long for it. We ask God for the longing that we need for that. Right? Um, second, we see that this world is hostile and accusatory toward the pilgrims, um, the pilgrim child of God. Um, but in the end, God brings justice in his own time. Okay. Uh, so we have a, a him saying here, you, uh, my, let's see, you rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. So who are these, uh, these um, insolent, accursed ones, right? Um, well, they're actually going to come up a few times in Psalm 119. It's actually a, a common, uh, I, I, I didn't write it down, but it's, I found a whole bunch of verses from the that mentioned these accused, uh, these are these insolent, accursed ones, right? That have one different commandments. They are, in this context, people who call themselves believers, Jewish people in this case, in this context, the people of Israel, who had walked away from his word, right? They have wandered from his commandments, right? They, they don't, they have, they have become apostate, right? Um, and it appears to be the case, given this verse, they take away from me scorn and contempt. That they are the source of that scorning contempt. They are um, scorning and contempting the psalmist. And, but here he's responding, for I have kept your testimonies, right? They are scorning me, but they have walked away from your word, but I have kept it, right? You see here the, the psalmist is claiming innocence, right? 
Um, some of them are even very powerful people. The next passage says, even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Right? Princes, right? I have a picture here is, of course, people of power, people with authority, right? Who have walked away from God's word, who are now plotting against the psalmist. Another indication, by the way, this is likely David. At the very least, almost certainly one of the kings of, 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 of Israel is writing this, or, or Judah is writing this passage, right? This verse on 19. Because otherwise, why would princes care? Why would the princes be attacking just some schmo on the side, you know, some song, some songwriter that happens to work on the choir, in the choir, right? You know, this is probably, what's that? A minstrel, yeah, they wouldn't care. Unless, unless he's kind of insulting kind of minstrel, the ones that kind of make fun of people, maybe that would care then. But, um, sorry, you know, comedic relief type, right? Now, uh, it's more likely that this is another evidence, this is probably that the writer of Psalm 119 um, is probably David or another king of Israel, someone in authority for whom the princes would have. And we'll see them come back too, by the way. There's other passages that bring up the princes that are attacking or are, 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 um, trying to plot against and other things the psalmist throughout the rest of Psalm 19. We'll see them come back a few times. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so, so we said some of them are very powerful, right? In the end, the psalmist knows that the right response is to trust God's word. So what does he do? He meditates on it. He meditates on the statutes. He, um, he, he, he basically he turns to God's word as a response to his accusations, right? These plots, right? Um, he trusts in God's word and the picture that God, of God that is found in his scripture. Because what is that picture? What is the name of God? We talk about the, the, one of the most beautiful things to find in scripture is the names of God. They describe his nature. They describe who God is given to us. And we know that God is just. God is righteous, right? Um, he is the ultimate judge of all, right? So when the psalmist is being falsely accused, he turns to God's word. He rests in the knowledge that God is just and that God will bring his justice in his time. And that does not mean that on this earth he will get that justice necessarily. We don't know that for sure. But we know that ultimately there will be justice for the one who's falsely accused, like the psalmist is claiming to be, right? Um, so in the meantime, the psalmist's goal is to meditate on God's word, to focus on that instead. Um, what the divine, and again, I love this, by the way, we talk about the, the different words here, statutes. Again, we remind you, what the divine lawgiver has laid down. So we have that connection to the law again. They're accusing him, right? And he's saying, I'm focusing and meditating on your law, the laws you've laid down, right? I am innocent, in this case, and I am focusing on that. I'm, I'm studying your word, and I'm, I'm meditating on it day and night, right? Um, so, when falsely accused, we can rest in God's word, and with God as our defender. Now, that does not mean that we don't respond to accusations, right? This is, this is not saying that if someone accuses us of something that we didn't do, we should respond. But the difference is, we rest in God's goodness and leave the results to him. Certainly, we defend ourselves, if that is righteous to do. And if we've done wrong, we confess, Right? We, are, we, we don't hold out when we are not in the right. right? But if we've done what is right and being accused falsely, as the psalmist is saying he is, right? then yes, we make a defense, but then we also rest in God. And we trust him with the result. And we cling further and more to his word. Um, and again, as a great example here, uh, let's say David wrote this. I think we could say that we have a picture here of this pilgrim in a hostile world, being accused of something he didn't do and trusting in God despite the circumstances. The true and better David, that is Christ, is the ultimate example of the pilgrim, of the one who has been who has come into a world that is foreign, essentially, right? He entered the world that was hostile to him, right? And he bared the burdens and sins of us as believers, right? And he did that despite the fact that the accusations were false. He did nothing wrong, right? Christ is the focus, the true and better David of this, right? And yes, we as Christians will, will, will bear our burdens the same way. We'll, we'll carry our crosses. We will, like him, be persecuted, right? But like Christ, we can trust the Lord's plan. And, and Christ was able to, to do exactly what he did because he knew God's word. And he knew his place in it, right? He knew he was called to suffer those things. Uh, and so he did so, knowing the outcome. And we are called to follow Christ. So in the same way, when the world persecutes us, right, we can trust in the Lord and the, the Lord and His Word, right? So, <clears throat> so in the end, we see the psalmist saying that your testimonies are my delight; they are my counselors. 
Um, this is actually going to say is our point three in this case. Point three is uh, that the child of God can delight in God's word. And his, in this case, the word testimony, his testimony, right? What God solemnly testifies to be his will. We can delight in God's plan for us, right? Trusting it even when we don't fully see it. But sometimes we don't know what God's plan is going to be for us. We, we are in the dark, but we know God is good. And we know his word tells us that we can trust in his plans for us, right? Um, it's funny, it's hard for us to understand to some extent how the psalmist is able to do this. Because the psalmist doesn't have Christ. He, he lives in a time before Christ has come, right? So how can he know this, right? You look at the threefold use of the law. We talked a long time ago, but the threefold use of the law. The, the, and the threefold use of the law, the first use, I'm going to briefly say this, the first use is to drive us to Christ, it is to convict us of sin, basically to hold up a mirror to us and to God and show us how we don't measure up. That's the first use of the law, conviction of sin. Right? The second use of the law is civil use. Right? That is to uh, basically punish evil throughout the world, restrain evil in the world, second use of the law. The third, though, is the one that only comes in with Christ, what we're going to call, for Christians, the normative use. Um, it is to show us the regenerate believers, right, what God wants of us as his children, how to live. Now that we are his, how then shall we live, right? That is the third use of the law. And as believers, we can joyfully accept that. We can love that. We don't feel the burden of the conviction of the law anymore, the first use of the law, because we know that Christ fulfilled it for us, right? But here the psalmist is doing that very thing. He is, the testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors, right? So, I would hazard a guess that the counselor, the, the, the writer of the psalm, clearly filled with the Holy Spirit, he's writing a psalm, right? This is scripture. He's being influenced by the Holy Spirit. He is looking forward, as we say, the Old Testament, they looked forward to the coming of Christ. Their faith was in the promises of God they knew would be fulfilled. And like Abraham, like many others, the psalmist's faith, psalmist's, this, this, psalmist's, psalmist's faith, wow, that was rough. <laughs> will be credited as righteousness. Right. So, so, so that is how we can say that that he was able to look ahead as we look back and say, indeed, your testimony is my delight. So with believers, we as children of God can say the testimonies of God can be our delight. Right? We can delight in them because Christ has come. No longer is there a burden of the law on us. So that it, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that we can, uh, that the three use of the law is a beautiful way of thinking about that and recognize that because of Christ, we can delight in his word, and delight in the law, and look for it for how to live. Um, and I love this last bit. They are my counselors, right? Um, what is a counselor? <laughs> yeah, that's it. A defense attorney, right, in this case, right? He is, he is facing uh, accusation. The law is, is his counselor. It's the one who's defending him, right? Not only that, it gives him comfort. It gives him advice. What does a counselor do as a king, right? A king's counselor gives him good advice. And, and here we have, in the law, God's word, the ultimate counselor, the ultimate source of truth, of guidance, right? Um, and we as believers can do the same. We can depend upon God's word as our counselor, right? Um, especially in times where we need comfort and guidance and defense, right, from false accusations. When we're, when the world is, seems to be against us, it is God's world that is our, our word that is our counselor, right? Um, the Holy Spirit working through it within us to comfort us and help us delight in it. So that's our third point there. Now, moving on to the next few points, we're going to move to our, the next passage, Daleth, right? And remember what I said about the psalmist. These next few pass next passages, we're going to see a different aspect of the psalmist, right? Um, this second passage finds the psalmist now describing himself as a man in love with the stuff of, the, of this foreign land, but who knows this, he knows this, he recognizes about himself, and is dependent upon God's grace which we recognize as well, it's us, right? We depend upon God's grace. Despite the fact that we are regenerate, we still depend upon God's grace every day. Okay, so point four is kind of the saddest point here, yeah, but bear with me because point, point three is, uh, point five is, is, is somewhat ha makes it better. Um, and point six as well. The child of God will still sin. The child of God will still sin. Look at the passage quick. My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told you of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away with sorrow. 
Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. So what's the picture here? Let's start with the beginning with the idea of the soul clinging to the dust, right? There's really two interlocking pictures here, right? Dust immediately brings to mind the grave, death, like the, the, the lowness of our souls apart from Christ, right? But an interesting picture there, it clings to the dust. It's not just in the dust. He's saying to some extent, I think it's reasonable to say, the soul is holding on to the worthless things of this world. Dust has no value. No one goes around selling, I mean, I don't think so. No one goes around selling dust, you know, uh, you know, five bucks for a, a bucket of dust. I mean, I guess you could buy like good sand for your playground or something, but that's not quite the same thing as just dust, right? Um, and so he's saying his soul is clinging to something that is essentially worthless. But he's clinging to it. Why is he clinging to something that has no value? Right? It, it, is, it is the old man still holding on to this world, this world that is, in fact, a world of death. A world that is in death, right? That has been, and because of the fall, only brings us death, right? So the contrast, he says, clearly, give me life according to your word. That is the contrast. So he's clinging to things of the world, but he's crying out to the Lord. Lord, I, I recognize I'm holding on to things that only bring death, things that are worthless. But I recognize this, and I'm crying out for life. Lord, give me life. Mm. What an amazing picture, right? And we know this as believers we know this. We've been there. We are there, right? Because we as believers still sin. We still hold on to worthless things. At least I do. Maybe maybe you don't. But I, I certainly still hold on to worthless things, right? Um, so we have a soul that's clinging to the worthless things of this world that bring only death and not life, right? Uh, so it's interesting to see this contrast, right? Because we have this psalmist who, in the last passage, was proclaiming his innocence of accusation, right? And in this passage is is, is recognizing... Um, that he has uh, not been righteous in this circumstance and, in fact, declares that lack of righteousness to the Lord. Look at verse 26. When I told you of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes, right? What is he telling God about? He's telling God. He's confessing. He's saying, yes, I, I cling to worthless things. You know, Lord, I, I'm telling you of these ways, these ways of worthlessness, right? Uh, teach me your statutes, right? Um, but here's the deal. Is he sitting around as a jelly feeling dejected about it? No. He's turning to God, right? He is going to the right place with his sin, with his failures, with his clinging to the world. He's going to God in Scripture. He is saying to God, you know, teach me your ways, right? Teach me your statutes. Give me life, right? I depend upon you in my sinful state. And we all do, right? Um, said, from God he asked for life, a greater knowledge of God's statutes, in order to better obey, right? Um, but notice, though, in verse 28, his soul melts away with sorrow, strains me the word. He is still feeling grief over what he did. And that doesn't go away necessarily. Yes, we sin. We feel grief over it. That grief turns us back to God, and we ask forgiveness. Does the grief necessarily go away right away? Not always. This is what Paul talks about as godly grief. Right? There is a godly grief that Paul talks about in, in 2 Corinthians um, 7 2 um, that produces repentance. And he contrasts that Paul does with worldly grief that only produces death. Here we have the psalmist grief driving him back to the Lord over his sin. Right? I, grieving over his sin, driving to the Lord immediately. Back where he goes. That's what we should do. When we sin, okay, the grief that we feel from that should drive us back to forgiveness. Because we have forgiveness in Christ, right? We don't cling, we don't keep worrying about the fact that we're clinging to the things of the earth. We try again. We stand up. We cling to the things of the Lord. And we find ourselves again in the dirt, clinging to the wrong things. We again let the grief guide us back to the Lord, right? This is, this is the cycle of growth that we go through as believers, right? So the child of God is not marked by an absence of sin, but the presence of repentance and a desire, a godly given desire not to sin. Right? Yes. Do we still sin? Yes. We still sin. That is the point. But we're marked not by that absence of sin, but by the presence of repentance. Praise God for that. That we can repent. Right? Uh, so when you come to God with repentance, um, if you're feeling that discouragement or condemnation, remember there is therefore no condemnation for those condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? God is not condemning you. He has forgiven you. Come to Him and ask for repentance. There's no condemnation there. Right? Uh, and then, if we're still feeling that dejected, focus on his word. 
Focus on what he's done. Don't focus on yourself, because that's another type of selfish sin. Focus on who he is and his promises. Say, God, you have promised to forgive me. You've promised that Christ is in send the gap, that he's paid for my sins. Whatever I feel doesn't matter. What you have done and promised is what matters. What I know to be true regardless of my feelings. It's funny, we had a whole, uh, we picked up Evelyn from uh, Worldview Camp this week, and the, we got to sit on one of the talks at the end of Worldview Camp. And the whole thing, a large portion of it, was talking about the modern man who lets his feelings guide everything, right? Who we have elevated feelings to truth. Well, if I feel it, it must be true. And that's in all areas of life. If I, feel, if I feel I am, you know, this or that, then that must be true about me. And so, therefore, you must acknowledge it and, and accept it as true, right? And we as believers know better. Now, are feelings legitimate and valid? Yes, the feelings can be legitimate and valid, but they are not our primary sources of truth. We do not guide our lives by what we feel. We guide our lives by what God's Word says. Simple as that. Um, when you repent, focus on God's character and nature, what He has done as revealed in Scripture. So again, back to Scripture, focusing on Scripture over and over again. Not surprising, these Psalms are all about God's Word. Right. Okay, point five. Okay, so we said in point four, that the child of God will still sin. But the child of God can sin less. Okay? Look at verse 30. I have chosen the, one, the ways of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. So we have here, the psalmist saying, I am choosing the way of faithfulness. All right? Okay. Now, we know, and in, in this, the psalmist is admitting as much throughout this passage because of his dependence and his prayers and his, and his requests, he knows he can't do it on his own, and neither can we, right? But in dependence upon God's power and his Holy Spirit in us, in dwelling us as believers, we can choose not to sin. We will still sin. We can choose not to. Remember the states of man, if you're familiar with Augustine's states of man, uh, if you're familiar with these, there was um, able to sin, that was in the garden, that was our first state of man, right? Then, after the fall, unable not to sin, the second state of man. We could not not sin. Double negative there. We must, we had to sin before Christ. Right? We could not not sin. Okay? It seems like a reasonable double negative there. It makes sense. Okay. Um, third state of man, according to Augustine, and, and of course many philosophers and, and theologians since him, right? Able not to sin. The believer, the regenerate person, is able not to sin. We will still sin. We are able not to. Right? The big important thing to think about there, right? Um, and again, when we fail, we we'll talk about that in a second. What we do, what we do in that case, but we are able not to sin in the third state of man. And that's where we're at right now. And of course, in glory and in the new earth someday, we will be unable to sin. That's the last state of man, unable to sin, right? Um, just to complete the arc there of of the four states, of man, right? Um, so the psalmist is saying he's choosing a better way. How is that possible, right? Well, not in our own power, not in his, and it's certainly not in the, not in the psalmist's power, but in Christ, right? Um, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we read, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation, he will provide, also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it, right? Similarly, uh, Romans 7, uh, well, actually, all of Romans 7. Let's just start there. Our large portion of Romans 7, how about that? Most of the end of Romans 7, right? Is about this thing. It's about Paul saying, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I do, I don't want to do. He's a struggle with sin. But he's recognizing that with the power of God in here, he says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. So even in despite his constant struggle with sin, he still delights in God's law, Paul says, right? But then in Rome, but stepping back one verse. So I find, it's Romans 7, 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, right? So we know this struggle, but that whole passage from verse 7 to 25, that pretty much 7 to the end of, of if you have time this week, read, read Romans 7, starting verse 7. Read the whole thing. It's a great passage. All of Romans. Read all of Romans. It's a great verse. Just read it. Um, but especially chapter 7, right? We see Paul's struggle, and we know this is our struggle. We recognize ourselves in this, right? But... The child of God will still sin, but is called to repentance and restoration. The pro this leads us to point six. The child of God will become more like Christ. I said, will become more like Christ. All right? Not can become, will become more like Christ. Because it's not on us. 
right? Get on the second there. But the psalmist put this face. So look at the end of this passage here. Um, let's see here. Uh, third verse one. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. This is a beautiful picture. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, the psalmist puts his faith in the Lord who will not put us to shame. We know from Romans 5.5. 5. Again, Romans. Um, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We're not put to shame when we trust in the Lord. So, again, the psalmist, is, is how did he know to have this full picture of Christ, right? Because, again, Christ has not come yet. But here he is still saying, <laughs> I cling to your testimonies. I, let me not put to shame. I think that even a better way of thinking this is he is saying, I know I won't be put to shame because I know who you are, right? So, yes, the psalmist didn't have the whole picture yet, but he knew, as we said before, to trust in the work of God, that salvation was coming, right? And his faith created his righteousness. And we, after Christ, can look back and see that, right? Thanks to the Holy Spirit, we have the power to say no to sin, but when we fail to do so, and we will, we have assurance in Scripture that Jesus has already covered our sins through his death, burial, and resurrection. We are covered when we fail. How much more should we then rejoice in God's word that we can try again, we can do it again, and we can fail again, and that's okay because, well, careful with that. Sin is never okay. Sin is always terrible, right? But we are forgiven, right? Every sin is terrible, but God has forgiven us a thousand, thousand, thousand fold. And to, it's, there is no limit on God's grace. So, do we sin all the more? No. What is, what is, again, Romans 6, right? What does he say? What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means, right? How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And there we are. And I think walking in newness of life is, is, is this picture, right, of the idea we were buried, our sin was buried with Christ. Now, we have new lives, we're new creations, right? Yes, last three points. We will still sin. We don't have to sin, but when we do, there is repentance. We are covered. What a beautiful picture. Um, we have been given amazing grace. The power and the freedom to refuse sin and the way forward for our sinful choices. Because that's what they are, they're sinful choices. We still choose the sin. But notice it's a choice. When we before Christ, we cannot even choose the sin. We just sinned. It was our natural state. We were the second state of man, right? Unable not to sin. But now we can choose not to, and we're covered when we fail, because we will. Um, so, as we put off our sin, we become more like Christ. This is the story of grace, right? Second uh, Corinthians 3.18 says, and, and, and we all, with unveiled face, behold the glory of the Lord, and being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, not from us. We do not choose to become more like Christ. He makes us more like himself, right? So when you're tempted to sin, remember this. We do not obey because it earns us favor. The favor is already ours. We are already credited. Christ Again, I love this picture, and Mike's missed this before, and I was, we don't have our sin taken away. That, that is true. Our sin was taken away. It was paid for. We are credited Christ's righteousness. The good he did is now ours. When Christ looked, when God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness, his good deeds. Praise God, right? Amen. So, um, we obey because, like the psalmist, we have chosen the way of faithfulness. By the power of Christ, the spirit within us, we can choose the way of righteousness, right? Um, again, because of his power, because he chose us first, we can choose the way of righteousness. We may stumble, but we're still on this path. Uh, the way of faithfulness, God has not placed us there. Sorry, God has placed us there, and we cannot leave it, right? The path is before us. We can't not walk it. He will do this, right? Um, he is always faithful to us, right? And we, 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 it seems like this, this verse was all that. 2 Timothy 2.11 the way this was saying is trustworthy. For we, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. 
If we deny him, he will also deny us. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. In the end, like the psalmist, we can know that God is at work in us. And we will not be put to shame for trusting in that. Right? Um, and I love this. The picture of this, of God working in us, is this picture he gives of an enlarging a heart. Now, normally, an enlarged heart is considered a medical problem. Right? I, my first thought, of course, was the Grinch. Right? Remember, the Grinch had a heart that was too small, and then it grew like three times and busted the, the frame of his little heart thing in the Grinch. The, the old, old version, Cartoon Bird, is my favorite of those, by the way. But... Um, that's a heart, that's a problem. If your heart actually is growing, this is not what we're talking about here. Go see a doctor, right? That enlarged heart is definitely not a good thing. But the picture here uh, is the same picture, by the way, that we see in 1 Kings 4 uh, when Solomon is blessed by God for his choice, his wisdom, right? And given wisdom, right? And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore. That breadth, that expansion of mind, the same words are used to describe this expansion of heart. It is an expansion of our ability to perceive God's truth, right? Um, it, it, sometimes it's rendered as breadth of heart, our breadth, 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 not breath, but breadth, width of heart, our mind, right, throughout Scripture, okay? So, God promises he will do this in us, right? And he is faithful. Um, so, uh, do you struggle believing that you are becoming more like Christ? I know sometimes I like, when I, have, I, have I become more like Christ? Am I really becoming more like Christ? Do I see any, any fruit in my life, right? If you struggle with that, some advice. Um, something that I don't do well, by the way. My wife does an incredible job of this. Um, keep a record of what God has done for you, right? This is why Israel in the, in the, in the Old Testament was called over and over again to create monuments, to create holidays, things to celebrate what God had done. So they can look back and see how far they'd come. Right? To make it something they tell their children, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren throughout generations to celebrate what God had done. Do it in your own life. Right? Write down what He has done. See how far you've come. Right? Many of us, uh, some, some here can probably look back and see incredible things God has done and they have no problem with this. Some of us are like, well, I guess I grew a little bit over the past couple of years. Maybe not. I don't know. Well, God has done incredible things in your life. Write them down. So you don't miss them. So you don't forget them because God knows we do. Right? That's why He told the Israelites to you know, write stuff down, you know, put things on their foreheads, put tassels on their stuff, right? All these things had meanings in the Old Testament to remind them of what God had done and who he was, right? So they wouldn't forget, right? Um, so so ask God to open your eyes to it. That's the second thing. If, if Let God, ask him to show you how he's changing you, right? He wants you to know he is, because he promises he is, that he is changing us, right? Um, like the psalmist, Ask for wisdom and understanding, which is what this passage is about here at the end, right? Um, enlarging the, of the heart, you know? Uh, ask for wisdom, right? Uh, James 1.5 says, promises that he will give it, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. That's a promise of God. Ask for wisdom, and you will be given it, right? Um, finally, like all this passage, but especially uh, what we see in 1 Thessalonians, Meditate on his word, especially passages like 1 Thessalonians, right? It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Surely do it, right? That is 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 So if you're going to pick a passage to meditate on, to think about, and to, to pray over, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23-24 is a reminder that you are being changed by God, not by your own power, but by His. So, this whole, by this whole second passage, by the way, what a beautiful picture here. We have the psalmist starts by discussing his cling to the dust, this picture of filth, dust, worthlessness. And he ends with a divinely enlarged heart, right? He see, the answer to his prayers is encoded in the very passage, right? We see his prayers being answered. So, in these two passages today, in conclusion, we saw two very different sides of the Christian life, right? Both true, both true of the psalmist, both true of us, right? We are indeed strangers in a strange land, persecuted for following Christ, and we should expect that, because Christ is persecuted, and he did nothing wrong, so we should expect the same. At the same time, we are still struggling with sin as Christians, right? We're not always above reproach. Because we do struggle with sin, right? Able not to sin, but still sinning and struggling with the old nature, but redeemed, forgiven, called out, right? So 
What brings rest in both circumstances, whether you're being persecuted wrongly and in a world that hates you, or, which we are, right? Or whether you are sinning and failing. We talk about the world, flesh, and the devil. Well, there's two of our enemies right there, the world and the flesh, two of our great enemies we talk about in Scripture, right? In both cases, it's the power of God working through his word, right, that redeems us, that comforts us, that brings us, here's the word, rest. Rest. Regardless of how you feel about it, you can trust and rest that God is growing you, He's changing you. He has redeemed you. And even if you don't feel like it, he has forgiven you. So this week, let it be our prayer to love and desire God's word. Um, ask him for obedience to it, right? Because we can obey his word now joyfully, which we couldn't ever have done before, right? And then finally, trust him with the results. So um, let's pray. Lord, I do pray that we would desire your word. Lord, help me to desire your word all that I am, Lord, because of your spirit working within me, Lord, something I could not do on my own. Lord, we need your help. We need your your guidance and your power in our lives, Lord. We pray for it now. Lord, I pray for everyone here that they would um, let your scripture guide them in truth, not their feelings, Lord, because it's so easy for all of us to fall into that, Lord. The feelings are so are they're there. They're, they're, they, they pull upon us, Lord. And they have legitimacy, but Lord, but they are not our guide. You are. Your scripture is our counselor. I pray it would be so this week. Lord, let us rest in you and in the gospel truth, Lord, that Jesus, you died for our sins and we are redeemed. Your righteousness is ours. In Jesus' name, amen.